Hi, I'm Bill Allison. I'm uh, editorial director at a group called the Sunlight Foundation in Washington, D.C. You can't hear? Oops. Let me pull this a little closer. Sorry about that. Is that a little better? I'm sorry. I've got like a um, <coughs> cold coming on, I think, so my voice isn't quite what it normally is. I'll try to project a little bit more. Anyway, I work for a group called the Sunlight Foundation in Washington, D.C. Uh, our goal is to make government more transparent, to get more information on the internet, to make more uh, accessible the kinds of things that government does, um, and to not just do that, but to get people to use their stuff and to dig into it and to be their own researchers. And you know, the best way to keep government honest is to have people engaged and interested in following it. And we try to make it easier for people to do that. Um, I'm grateful to Free Press for inviting us to this panel today. Uh, we're going to be looking at how you use some of the resources that Sunlight and other organizations produce. I'm joined by uh, John Dunbar, <coughs> excuse me, who I used to work with at the Center for Public Integrity. Um, John has uh, been an Associated Press reporter. He's currently at the Investigative Reporting Workshop at American University. And he uh, really knows more about media organizations, whether it's um, telecom companies, cable companies, television. He ran the incredibly successful Well Connected project at the Center for Public Integrity that looked at media ownership. And uh, he's going to kind of take you through um, kind of what the issues are in the industry right now. Uh, I'm also joined by Sheila Krumholtz, who runs the fantastic Open Secrets website for the Center for Responsive Politics. Uh, this is kind of one-stop shopping for federal influence, for finding out about campaign contributions, lobbying, uh, members of Congress's backgrounds. And then I'll show you some tools at the end which you can use to um, both access data and some, do some things with it. Um, at this point, I think I will turn things over to John. And uh, one of the things I do want to say, though, this is really uh, you know, a session for you. And um, if there are questions, we're going to leave a big question and answer session at the end. Uh, please use a microphone, and I'll remind you of that when I'm done with my presentation. So John, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Bill. Hi, everyone. Thanks to Free Press for uh, inviting me. I'm gonna, I guess I'm going to hunch. <coughs> Can you hear me OK? Good. Um, I can try without breaking anybody's eardrums. What? Okay. That doesn't work. Nope. Doesn't work. Never mind. This works. I'll just talk really loud. It's not hard for me. It's a button. Okay. You hear me? Yeah. Ah. I can work with this. Um, as I was thinking about what to talk about <coughs> last night, today, um, it struck me that um, I got into media and investigating media right around the same time that Free Press started to really catch hold. Uh, I was at their conference in Madison, Wisconsin, I don't even know how many years ago. Um, and it's amazing how big the group is now. It's, it's really quite shocking. In those days, um, the issue was media consolidation, and it was actually pretty simple. Um, you had these titanic media companies, and you had uh, government, and government wanted to let these titanic media companies get even more titanic. And they were all obscenely profitable, and people were sort of getting their news on the web, but not really. The, the web was kind of a, we know it's going to be a big deal, but we really don't know what it's going to do exactly. Um, so the issues were pretty simple, and the reporting actually was pretty simple too. And most of these companies were publicly traded companies, so if you wanted to find out about them, all you had to do was look at their SEC filings. They're publicly traded. Um, they all lobbied. They all made contributions. It wasn't it wasn't terribly complicated. <coughs> um, but 
since then, <laughs> uh, but believe it or not, the FCC is actually doing a review of the rules again. It's happening right now as we speak. And I'll give you a dollar for every news story you've seen on that. No, nobody's covering it. The reason that nobody's covering it is because nobody cares. And the reason that nobody cares is because there's been not a sea change, but kind of a uh, nuclear explosion in the media world since 2001, 2002, 2003, which is when they actually loosened the rules. Um, what, what has happened, uh, as, as we know, uh, what, hit the men, what hit the media industry, which is, I, I, I would say it's undergoing a, a total transformation. I think that's probably the best way to, to put it. Thanks, thanks to technology uh, and, and, of course, the Internet. Um, so, really, the issue lately hasn't been so much about consolidation, but about the survival of the news business itself. Now, I'm not sure that anybody, you know, I've been a reporter for 18 years, nonprofit reporter, for-profit reporter, pretty much every kind of reporter you can be. Um, and I've never seen it like this. And I have a lot of friends who are out of work and who are scrambling for jobs. Um, it's, it's real. It's real. What's happening is real. There's still a lot of companies making a lot of money, but it's, but it's not what it used to be. The media industry, like I said, is going through this massive transformation. I'm just going to throw out some really, I don't, I don't know, maudlin statistics. Um, <laughs> the <laughs> newspapers, in my mind, and I'm biased because that's where I got my start, uh, are, are where really the best journalism uh, comes from most times, other than some really excellent documentary work that I've seen. Um, uh, they're 30% smaller than they were in 2000. This is from Pew, which does a wonderful state of the media uh, survey every year that I really strongly urge you to look at if you really want to read, read about this stuff. Um, ad sales hit a 25-year low in 2010. Uh, 2010, the largest, uh, the, the sector with the largest number of corporate defaults was media, the media sector. Um, the, the question is what's, you know, what is behind the change? And I mentioned that it's technology and it's the internet and it is uh, basically tradition, traditional media's inability to convert to an online world in a profitable way. Now, when you talk about the, the newspaper business, they had a 15-year head start. They have more money than God. They had more content than any other organization in the world. And they still haven't figured out a way to make any money off the internet. That's staggering to me. To, to figure out a way to make money off of the internet, you needed a couple of guys, and it's, a, it's a myth, but you needed a couple of guys in a garage in Silicon Valley who could create an algorithm who did Google. Those are the guys who figured out how to make money off the internet, not the newspaper guys. And that culture is still entrenched that way. In uh, <coughs> 2010, for the first time, uh, more people got their news online than in newspapers. 47% of Americans now say that they get uh, at least some news on a, a mobile device. Um, th this, this massive transformation has absolutely changed, changed everything, including the definition of media itself. Uh, there's been an explosion in um, organizations that don't even gather news. In fact, people kind of forget that gathering news is, is a skill. And I'm still working on it, and I've been doing it for a long time. Um, it's kind of a craft. It used to be considered to be a craft, just like elec being an electrician is a craft. You work a long time to be a good reporter. I, 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 I still aspire to be a good reporter. Um, but we've got these aggregators out there. Um, and by aggregators, I mean you're just bunching news from other sources, free news, of course, free links. Um, they're very popular, but they're very powerful. And if you can gather an audience and bring them together, then, well, are you a media baron now? Um, well, you kind of are, aren't you? Especially if you can sell ads to that site. But do you, do you have to know anything about news or sources or ethics or anything like that? Not particularly. I'm not saying that, that's, that you should, but I'm just saying that you know, that's how, how things have really changed. Um, just a couple other quick things, and I'm, I'm, I think you folks are going to want to hear what my colleagues have to say because they've got these fabulous tools for how to investigate media companies, and I'm just sort of trying to lay the, lay the land. Um, and I'm going to speed through the rest of my thoughts here real quick. The end result of what's happening, well, I mean, it's just a couple of other observations. We don't really even have publicly traded media companies anymore. The ones that we do have imploded. Knight Ritter doesn't exist anymore. 
the Tribune, if anybody follows the Tribune company, my God, what a catastrophe. This is a 150-year-old newspaper, one of the best in the country, and, and the company is just a, is a complete shell of what it was. It's a tragedy. It's, it's a real tragedy. Um, and you don't have to watch The Wire to know that. I mean, that's, that's the most realistic newsroom portrayal I've seen on television so far, is, is during that, that show, if you watch it, in the Baltimore Sun. Um, <coughs> I'd never worked there, though. Basically, the old economic model has, uh, has absolutely broken down. So uh, what, what does that mean for you and me and all of us? Well, it means it makes it a heck of a lot tougher to investigate the media because I'm not even sure what the definition of media is anymore. Um, it changes every day. Um, and, and another aspect of this is don't think that the media companies, because they're hurting, aren't powerful. They're enormously powerful, and what they're most powerful, the greatest power they have is goodwill and credibility. Um, if I can buy a, a company that has goodwill and credibility, and I, can, and I could talk it into saying that global warming doesn't exist, that's a pretty good investment for me. You know, I, I may call me paranoid, I don't know. I, I just see that, that value that a lot of other people don't see. Um, and that sort of leads to the next little factlet, which is of the 25 largest metropolitan newspapers in the country, seven are owned by hedge funds. You think it's hard to investigate a publicly traded company? Try investigating a hedge fund. Disclosure on hedge funds is almost non-existent. These are, these are some of the guys that helped us get into the financial mess that we just are slowly starting to climb out of. Right now, because there are so many reporters off the job, PR staff is outnumbering reporters by about, I don't know what the figure was that I last saw, something like 20 to 1. Reporters are overworked. They don't have the time to do the stories that they want. Right now, there is uh, an absolute boom in the propaganda business. Um, if you are good at, and this is, this is perpetrating a fraud on the public, let me be clear what their business is. It's to perpetrate a fraud on the public, to get you to believe that something is news or fact, or that they are a legitimate organization when they are, in fact, somebody who's showing for a corporation. I've seen this for as long as I've been in the news business. It's greater now than it's ever been, and they're better at it than they've ever been. And when I pick up the newspaper, almost every time I read it, I can see it as some propaganda campaign from some corporation or another that some reporter didn't have the time to vet the source. <coughs> That's kind of a bugaboo of mine. So we're moving to a point where, uh, really on the news side, where everybody's going to be able to have their own private newspaper. You know, you're, you're going to be able to have, like, your phone is going to be your own newspaper. used to be, you know, we can't have, like, 300 million newspapers. We can now. And, and so ha I don't know how you make money off of that. I mean, so, so what's happening is this fragmentation. We're getting the super specialized publications. Uh, among them, as I put a story in the back that I did yesterday, among them was somebody that I just wrote a story for yesterday's uh, Politico, which has done a, a really good job of, you know, breaking into the scene in Washington. Um, they, that, that story ran in something called Politico Pro. That's not the free version. That's the $1,000 plus version. There's an entire, uh, that's why I put it on our website. <laughs> I didn't distribute their version. Um, there, there are, there's an entire industry developing for what we used to call derisively, us mainstream reporters, as, uh, help me out here, Bob, <coughs> the uh, newsletter writers. You know, you can pay one, two, three thousand dollars. Bob's an old, another old reporter. He's at Consumers Union now. Uh, not that old, sorry, Bob. But they, they um, <laughs> uh, newsletter writers write for a corporate audience, and they the corporate audience pays a ton. And we're seeing lots of really good reporters move into that line of work. So what do you got? You've got a news, super good news, super pointed news for what? Rich people <laughs> and rich corporations. You know, these guys are moving off of the regular media and moving into the specialized areas. I said I was going to hurry and I'm slowing down. The, the, another niche is local. Local news is always going to be hot. I'm always going to care if there's a rapist who lives behind me. Um, not many people are very good at, uh, not, none of the big news organizations have been very good at, at nailing down, you know, how to cover local news, even now, they still don't recognize the value of it. Uh, so others are taking their, they're eating their lunch. And then the rise of nonprofit journalism, which is a good thing. That's, that's us. Um, that's uh, Sunlight. That's, uh, that is the Committee for Investigative Reporting in San Francisco, the granddaddy of them all. That's the Center for Public Integrity, which has hired John Solomon, who's one of the best reporters 
in the world uh, who's uh, working there. They are actually writing a daily newspaper for, for the center now. Um, and there are many, many other nonprofits. Um, this is a, a good thing, but there's, you know, there's, there, there are, it's not the best thing either, but I'm, I'm not going to get too far into that. It's, it's hard to work for a nonprofit, ma mainly because you have to rely on partners to get your word out. And reporters are not very good at asking other reporters or other editors to, to run their stuff. <coughs> so, uh, well, while there's been fragmentation uh, among these businesses that report the news, uh, on the distribution side, it's been absolutely the opposite. We had eight regional bell companies that are now three. We have AT&T, Verizon, and Quest. Quest just underwent a, a major merger. Cable's king, uh, absolutely king. We've got Comcast and Time Warner, and then a number of regional monopolies, and they are monopolies in their local markets. Um, about three quarters of all broadband are controlled by these companies that I just mentioned in the country. In the country, just staggering. You want to talk about media consolidation? Talk about the distribution outlet. The other side is fragmenting. The the, the distribution outlet is not. It's it's continuing to be even more concentrated. Uh, Comcast has uh, done something that. Uh, uh, well, I'm not exactly sure <coughs> to explain why they did it exactly, but they they took over uh, NBC. And I wrote 3,500 words on it. They took over <laughs> NBC Universal. Um, this is this is a concern because this is a pipeline company that's taken over content. The idea was that if you own the movie theater, uh, you don't own the movie studio. I mean, that was a Supreme Court case. Um, for some reason, that's not relevant anymore. That's so that a content company is also a distribution company. Um, so you, you've got them moving in moving into content. Uh, on the wireless side, and we know we're all going wireless. Eventually, it's all going to go wireless. Uh, we've got uh, AT&T is going to buy T-Mobile. There's four national carriers. So AT&T is going to go to the Department of Justice, and this is going to be a gut check for the Department of Justice. Do you, know, do you really think that going from four to three is a good idea, three national carriers? And AT&T is literally arguing that four minus one equals five. <laughs> and you've got to understand that these guys make... Uh, enough money and they're good enough at this to get people to actually believe that. And I'm actually seeing people who actually believe that in Washington. They're some of the sharpest lobbyists that you're ever going to talk to. And after you get done listening to them, you're going like, I think that probably is going to be good for consumers. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm going to cut off the rest of what I was going to say. Uh, I didn't even get a chance to talk about my project. Go to that website. Please. We don't, get, we don't get nearly enough traffic. Uh, I'm going to end on a high note. Um, even with all of the, uh, you know, the bleak uh, news for the news uh, business, there is, there is one, one shining light, one silver lining in a cloud, and that is <laughs> Citizens United. That is, that is the decision by the Supreme Court to let anybody give as much money as they want to any campaign and not say who they are. Lots of people talk about contributions. Nobody talks about contribution spending. Spending goes to media. It's going to be great for media, absolutely great for media. But Sheila will probably be happy to talk more about Citizens United. Um, and I think I'm just going to stop right there. What is your website? Uh, the website is <laughs> investigativereportingworkshop.org. And then my little world is called Connected up there. And we, do, uh, we did a really neat broadband study of uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, we do some money in politics stories, which is what that one was about. Made, made Congressman Greg Walden very, very, very angry, I understand. And if you keep your eye on that, because we're getting ready to drop a second piece of the broadband study um, to look at what, I, what, as far as I'm concerned, is the most important issue that's going on right now, and that is access to affordable, fast broadband connections. Absolutely key. Anyway, I gotta I gotta let these guys talk. So thank you. This is Sheila Krumholtz and absolutelyopensecrets.org is the place to go. It's it is the one stop shop for all political influence. So I'm gonna can I still use his? Is this is that gonna work for me so I can also run the website? Okay, great. I'll try to hunch. Well, I don't know if I agree that Citizens United is the high point. <laughs> I think I agree that Investigative Reporting Workshop is, uh, is a high point, as is 
uh, the Sunlight Foundation, which you'll hear about shortly. Uh, first of all, I wanted to ask how many of you are familiar with OpenSecrets.org? Okay, so quite a few. Great. Well, um, let me head there first. Um, just to give you some background, we are a nonpartisan, nonprofit research group that tracks money and politics. That's pretty much all we do. We exist to do one thing and do it really well in an unbiased way. We don't cook the numbers. We, uh, our goal is really to put out unassailable facts about where the money is coming from and going to at the federal level only. We only track money at the federal level uh, and, and let the chips fall where they may. And of course, in a democratic uh, administration, a lot of the money is going to the Democrats and in a Republican administration, a lot of the money is going to the Republicans and both parties can make hay out of it. We have, uh, I think, a unique asset in that our data is seen as being uh, unbiased. We're certainly very concerned about our reputation as uh, being a reliable resource. And as it turns out, we have a very um, varied audience. About 40% of our users have self-identified as conservative, uh, uh, about 50% uh, 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 left-leaning liberal, and then um, you know, others in the middle. But we, we try to, again, just be an honest broker and, and put it all out there. We gather the data from government sources, from the Federal Election Commission, which may not be doing a very good job on the enforcement. I mean, we can talk about whether they're doing a good job on the enforcement side, but they do a great job on gathering the data. We uh, vet it for errors, uh, which we find in all kinds of government data that we provide, so, or that we, we, we take in, uh, whether it's lobbying data or personal f finances of politicians and key officials. Uh, and then we provide that, that, uh, those fixes, those corrections, back to the federal election to correct the public record. And we process it, we code it by industry, which is, uh, I think, the principal thing we're known for is uh, allowing you to, at a glance, understand where the money is coming from in you know, the broadest terms down to the most granular level. And then we standardize it by organization, and we research and apply uh, parent-child relationships to the data so that you can see across time how organizations morph, or in the case of uh, telecom uh, industry, uh, how they uh, uh, become more centralized. and. Um, and then we aggregate and profile it on our website, opensecrets.org, but we also now make it available through support from the Sunlight Foundation so that anyone can grab our value-added you know, millions of records of transaction-level detail to inform their own websites, to pull in widgets and APIs, to provide streaming data uh, on whatever it is that they're interested in, be it media, communications companies, or environmental and energy companies, et cetera. And uh, also, of course, importantly, making this data now available to other organizations that are using it to mash up with their own data sets. So you could mash it up with uh, uh, you know, government subsidies of industries or uh, uh, what were we just talking about, John? Broad mashing it up with um, uh, the rates of access, broadband access, and how that, how that relates to um, uh, demographic data about you know, which communities are afforded the, the high-speed access and which ones are not getting access at all. So that's what we're trying to provide. Uh, and then we slice and dice it as many ways as possible to make, to anticipate the kinds of questions that you may want to ask. So I'm just going to drill in uh, through our website. I hope you'll explore it on your own. It's a very rich uh, resource. Um, uh, and it's, I think over the years, we've, because we're a small nonprofit in Washington, we've geared our work and our outreach toward the mainstream media. Of course, the mainstream media is, is uh, not so, uh, uh, not what it once was, and so we're branching out, but we're also looking for ways to make it more intelligible to the average user. So we'd love to have your feedback on how, we're, how we can best do that. Let's drill in through the influence and lobbying section here on openseeks.org and go straight to heavy hitters, which, is the, um, which are the top organizations uh, providing campaign cash back in time, back to 1989. And lo and behold, uh, right after ActBlue, which is kind of a misnomer because ActBlue is so, uh, is a very powerful fundraising organization, but it's also, uh, to some degree, uh, a fundraising tool that uh, uh, Democratic candidates and parties use. So AT&T is our top 
source of uh, uh, campaign cash for federal parties and candidates over the last couple of decades. And if we, so $46.3 million back to 1989. And if we drill in, you'll, uh, and, and, and I should note there, you'll see here that that uh, the, uh, on the top list, whether it's back in time or within a cycle, unions will always figure highly on those lists. They are, uh, I, you know, I think you, ha you, you support your argument by being very clear and factual about where the money's coming from. It's coming from unions, too, at the top of the list. And, and, and figuring highly in the top 10, 20 organizations on almost any list. The thing is, there aren't that many unions compared to corporate America. And so overall, when you compare unions to corporate donations, 70% of the money is still coming from corporations. Uh, but, but unions, and particularly through their PACs, are, are powerhouses that um, are certainly feeling uh, the heat in state capitals across the country, as well as in Washington. So AT&T, let's look at this quickly. Uh, you see at a glance the contribution trends, big soft money right before the last call at the soft money bar for parties in 2002, and then uh, dropping down in 2004. Uh, no uh, uh, top individual contributors giving 50000 or more, but you see here again a huge spike in spending and lobbying uh, earlier this decade and then uh, maintaining levels at over $1.5 million uh, for the last uh, four years. Uh, so you can uh, go deeper into the campaign contributions, which I'll do here on the totals tab. So you can see uh, for your research, for your advocacy, uh, exactly how much they're giving and to whom. Uh, at a glance, you can see 44%, $3.9 million last cycle, 44% to Democrats, 55% to Republicans. That is actually very typical of... Uh, corporate America. They hedge their bets by giving to both sides, um, often evenly, 50-50, uh, in the case of uh, uh, the computer industry and some financial uh, uh, interests. But here, 44 to 55, very common to give kind of slightly more uh, to one side or the other, whichever one they think is going to uh, uh, carry water for them in, uh, in Congress and uh, in the administration. And, and over time, exactly that, 44, you know, over the last since 1989, 44% to Democrats, 55% to Republicans. So this is a very calculated strategy. Democrats yes? Democrats are a big thing. There's the Democratic con Congressional, there's the Democratic Senatorial. This is Democratic candidates and parties. Everybody Hard money going to all federal candidates and parties. But of course, most of the money goes to the incumbents who are in a position to actually do, uh, do something on behalf of the donors. Yes, any federal candidate or party committee. Um, so the, the six national party committees and all federal candidates. And then when you look at it by, uh, uh, by source of funds, you see uh, a, a big chunk of the money in, in the case of AT&T specifically, but also for other corporations. It's coming from their PAC. Uh, they, like unions, are using the PAC. Uh, they get uh, individual uh, employees to... Uh, commit to giving uh, through, you know, in kind of directly through their uh, uh, their wages, garni kind of garnishing their wages for the PAC. And actually, in some cases, it's very controversial for them to have to reorganize their PAC because then they have to, they're, they're supposed to ask again if the employee will allow them to uh, extract money, uh, you know, with each check for the PAC, and they don't want to have to do that because once they've got them in, they've got them in. And the difference between, uh, I don't know why I'm harping so much on, on corporations versus unions, I guess it's just, you know, of, it's, <laughs> it's in the news, it's a, it's a hot uh, topic right now, and it's going to continue to be as long as uh, uh, budgets are uh, being slashed uh, across the country. But, but corporations, um, uh, you know, one, I think, significant difference about how PACs are utilized is that corporations are directing their PAC funding to uh, specifically benefit the economic interest of the, of the company, uh, uh, whereas, and it's led by professional staff, whereas the staff that is directing the spending of the union PAC is uh, uh, elected. 
so one, I think, kind of key difference with how, how that money is, is uh, spent. But so $3.4 million spent from the PAC, 500, nearly $500,000 uh, coming from individuals associated with the company. We get a lot of questions about, well, why do you include individuals associated with the company? Because that's not the company. They might be giving because of abortion issues or policy in Iraq or uh, uh, LGBT or you know, environmental, whatever. who knows? Well, the thing is, we're including just contributions that are of $200 or more than $200. And we can examine who these people are. And I can tell you uh, from years and years of experience of fingerprinting each and every individual donor giving more than $200 to candidates and parties that this is not your rank and file America. These are a very tiny elite set of Americans who can afford to give contributions of more than $200 and often are willing to give the maximum uh, uh, possible donation of thousands of dollars to a specific candidate or party and all told able to give uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars through hard money as well as soft money uh, contributions to outside interest groups. So uh, uh, I think it's absolutely not only legitimate to include this individual donations, which in the 2008 cycle was $1.1 million to the $3.3 million impacts, but also necessary because if you're excluding that money, you're excluding in some cases 70% of the money that's representing these, uh, these interests, uh, for, particularly for uh, uh, certain industries. Yes? Oh, I'm sorry, you're supposed to, I should have told you, you're supposed to use the, uh, the microphone. Her question is whether Citizens United has had an impact and whether we're doing studies on that. It has certainly had an impact. I'll be talking about that a, a, very sh a little bit, and then Bill will as well. But uh, certainly, I mean, it, it, I think it's critical to look at the money that you can, uh, uh, the hard money going directly to candidates and parties, because I think that is extremely valuable, more valuable to the candidates who have to raise uh, millions of dollars to wage a viable campaign for Congress, uh, more important to them. Uh, but you can't ignore the influence of these uh, uh, huge sums of money being spent to directly sh uh, impact the outcome of elections. So uh, I don't think it's I don't think they're equivalent. The money going directly into the pockets of ca or into campaign coffers, um, but it, it it does beg the question: How powerful is this? All this outside money swirling around out there, uh, as compared to the money going to candidates and parties, and uh, and you know what what are we really able to see? Uh, the fear, of course, is that we're really just focusing uh, laser-like on the tip of the iceberg, having no idea how much more uh, money is underneath the surface and how, how influential that is. So let me uh, continue quickly so we can get, uh, get Bill up here. Uh, so those are kind of the, the, the big top-line uh, trends on where the money is coming from. You can also see uh, where the money is going to. And so we uh, look at it kind of, again, from a bird's eye view here. Uh, overall, more money, you see the blue and red lines, overall more money going to Republicans, way more money going to incumbents than non-incumbents, not really interested in helping out the struggling challengers, uh, more interested in uh, lining the pockets of people who are actually in a position to help them and their legislative agenda in Washington. and. Um, and on average, uh, as well as overall, giving uh, more money in both chambers uh, to uh, the GOP versus uh, the Democrats. So 8.4, uh, 8,000 to Republicans, 6,000 to Democrats in the House, and uh, 4,000 on average to Republicans, 3,000 to Democrats in the Senate. And then you see down below who specifically they are targeting their, their contributions towards. So 77,300 to John Boehner, Speaker John Boehner, in this last cycle as compared to the next uh, top recipient as uh, Majority Leader Harry Reid with 31,750. Uh, so this is, I think, a useful tool when you are looking at legislation which is coming up within, uh, you know, in a particular committee or subcommittee and you want to see whether, you know, I think it's important for reporters but also for uh, citizens and, and certainly activists to uh, know what the, um, what the money profile is for these uh, people who have tremendous influence over specific uh, legislative um, uh, you know, policy debates. Not that money is 
the only influence here or, the, you know, or not necessarily the most important influence. What we always tell people is you have recourse. Money doesn't uh, vote for members of Congress, you do. And uh, hidden money, uh, money that is not scrutinized, is far more powerful than money that is uh, open to uh, your monitoring. So as long as members of Congress, politicians, candidates know that you are on the case, uh, examining where the money is coming from, and you will hold them accountable for their views and question them about their uh, reliance on these special interests that have, uh, uh, you, you know, that's that provide their uh, re-election campaign, uh, I think they will be much more nervous about taking that money and, and uh, having these kind of backroom deals and conversations with uh, well-heeled lobbyists working on behalf of these interests. Uh, we also look at it by congressional committee. I won't go there because we haven't, we're just about in this next week to post uh, the refreshed committee profiles for the, 2000, for the uh, 112th Congress. Uh, but I will skip over to the lobbying section because, of course, this is the other side of the, can of the coin, of the influence buying coin. And so you see here, uh, at a glance, where the money's coming from and the bills specifically that they've been working on. We can't know, one can never know, how much money specifically is being attributed to a particular bill. They need not report it in that way. Uh, but we can see how many times uh, they report a particular bill on. Uh, their quarterly reports. So we can see that for the Arbitration Fairness Act of 2009, they reported having lobbied on that in 27 separate reports. And the Bank and Savings Association Holding Company, on and on, Spectrum Relocation Improvement Act of 2009, 23 reports uh, noted that they were actively lobbying on, on that issue. Diving further, though, into this profile, you'll see uh, a little bit more about how they gain influence. So in just 2010, $15.3 million spent, I said, sorry, earlier I said 1.5, I meant $15.3 million, and when we're going back to uh, 2005, 2006, uh, upwards of $25 million in a single year spent to influence legislation and um, and uh, uh, you know, regulatory influence in Washington. Down below, we've enumerated not just how much they're spending. Um, uh, so you see overall that it's 15.3 million, and then we've enumerated who the hired guns are specifically that are working on their behalf and how much they're being paid uh, by AT&T alone, and then also subsidiaries, if any, uh, that are uh, that they're representing. If you drill in. Uh, further, you can see exactly how many and who uh, are the lobbyists that are uh, uh, marching up to Capitol Hill on their behalf. And I show this page in part because I also want you to see the revolving door icon so you get a sense. Uh, the, the, the gold circle next to the names uh, are the people who are former government staffers, uh, committee staffers, who then have spun through the revolving door to take far more lucrative positions, working for the very interests that they help to oversee while, uh, while in Congress and in government. And this uh, uh, Capitol Hill icon shows you uh, how many are working on their behalf that, um, that were former members themselves. So Vic Fazio, John Bro, Trent Lott, Jim Davis, J.C. Watts, I, this is uh, Michael Forbes, this is p firepower. 93 lobbyists, all told, uh, working for them in just 2010 alone, not even including all of the senior advisors that are helping them shape their uh, message and telling kind of generals leading from the rear. So they're not make me, maybe making the contacts to covered officials, but they're telling people how to wage this battle uh, successfully on Capitol Hill. You, uh, I, I want to uh, leave time for... Um, for Bill, so I think I should uh, leave it there, but I'll just point out that you can search for it by issue. Uh, so these are kind of the broad issues uh, that they've uh, uh, reported having worked on telecommunications, of course, is number one, as well as taxes. Every corporation is working on taxes, radio and TV broadcast broadcasting, torts, et cetera. The agencies specifically that they're targeting, USTR, the trade representative, uh, followed by the House and Senate, of course, and, um, and then the specific bills and links to the report images. So you can drill in and find the specific uh, reports that they are filing 
uh, on Capitol Hill, but our site hopefully is a, a way for you to get at it, again, much more quickly and, and organized in a way that it's uh, at a glance if you want it, but with the ability to drill down and find more detail. Um, I'm sure we're going to talk more about the outside spending with Bill, so I'm going to leave it there and let Bill come on up. Okay, at the risk of... Oops. I'm going to try to switch out and use my machine here. Okay, um, so okay, you've gotten kind of the overview from um, of some of the different tools that are out there, and I guess what I'm sort of interested in, let's see if we can get that to snap, is, oh good, it's up there, okay. So what I'm sort of always been interested in is how this stuff actually works. I and mean, we saw the 89 lobbyists at AT&T have, what are they actually doing? What are they up to? How do they influence the process? I mean, how does this, these things actually work? It's not just that you sign up a form and you have a list of 89 people. They're actually out there doing things every day, trying to influence Washington and trying to influence government policies. And I wanted to pull up this. This is an old story from Wired from 2007 from um, a blog called uh, Threat Level. And uh, it was um, uh, Ryan Single who did this. Back in 2007, uh, there was a huge issue over whether or not telecom companies, which supplied the government with cell phone records, calling records of U.S. citizens uh, to overseas, whether or not they were going to be subject to a lawsuit. And when the Democrats took power in 2007, the thought was is that the telecom community would go away, that these companies could be sued for giving out people's personal information. And suddenly, uh, Jay Rockefeller, who was uh, chairman of the relevant Senate Intelligence Committee, uh, kind of flip-flopped and said, well, you know what, we are going to have telecom immunity in this bill. And what he did was he took a look, and this is um, Jay Rockefeller's campaign, this little chart here. And the spike there is for Verizon, who beginning in 2007 suddenly started pumping money into his campaign. Uh, there's another one down here, I believe it's yeah, AT&T, employee contributions, and I think there was uh, PAC as well. And so suddenly he's getting a lot of money. And the question is, you know, well, you know, so we can all kind of figure out why. Uh, that these companies are interested suddenly in Jay Rockefeller. And then, um, but I think it's, it's even more, um, you can get even more fine than that. I mean, this is just looking at the contributions over time. However, you know, a lot of times you're going to see a lot of noise. Um, you know, usually it's not quite this clear or not quite this clean. So um, one of the things that Sunlight Foundation has done is we do this little blog called, or a blog and website and database called Party Time. And this kind of started in, I think it was 2006, when I had a, a friend who I like to think of as a recovering lobbyist and now is a lawyer in a Washington firm that still does lobbying. And he was complaining to me about how, like, he'd be waiting for briefs or, you know, other things to be faxed to him, documents and whatnot. And the firm's fax machines were just overflowing with these invitations sent to lobbying offices by congressional com uh, candidates for Congress, uh, incumbent members of Congress. Uh, this actually flows both ways. Members of Congress desperately need lobbyists as much as lobbyists need members of Congress. They do a tremendous amount of fundraising in Washington, D.C. And so when he told me this, I said, well, I'll take them off your hands. You know, I'll come by and pick them up. So I started getting these things. We started posting them, I think, just in blog items as just PDFs. I post the fun. I mean, it was amazing. There's like, I would love to do a museum of these. Like, some have these great artworks. Some have like these uh, funny themes. Uh, but this is one that I thought was kind of interesting. And this is sort of a typical thing you can find in this database. This is an invitation for an upcoming fundraiser for Roger Wicker, April 14th, 2011. Wicker is a member. Uh, he was on the um, Senate. Um, uh, see, science, transportation, and uh, commerce, science, and transportation. He's on the subcommittee that deals with telecommunications. Um, and here he's got, we have this fundraiser. And what's interesting is, if you look uh, under the beer and burgers, uh, this isn't, this, you know, artistically, this is not one of my favorites. But you can see there's a, a bunch of hosts. And there's Jordan Bernstein, who's a guy who works for Cassidy and Associates. 
Uh, there's Dan Gans, who's a lobbyist for AT&T, as well as other companies and, uh, for a private firm. Greg Hartley, same thing. Dan Mattoon, same thing. And then we see the AT&T PAC, and these are the hosts of this fundraiser. Now, it doesn't actually mean that they're physically hosting the event. What it means is they've contributed enough money to his campaign uh, over the years uh, and, you know, and recently so that they are listed on this invitation sent out to other people in Washington to signal their support of this member of Congress. Um, and they even have little things, how much you're supposed to give. Hosts are supposed to raise or give $2,500. Attendees raise or give $1,000. And I just wanted to kind of show you, so okay, so who are these guys? And I'll just show you real quick who Dan Mattoon is. Uh, let's go, so I'm gonna show you Open Secrets, which we use all the time. I'll try not to make it. We're gonna search for an individual lobbyist and just put in Mattoon. And is that sir? Yes. So there he is, and we can find out exactly who he is. So he's at Mattoon and Associates, a lobbying firm. We have his revolving door profile. You see he represents AT&T. Oh wait, I should go back to that real quick because I thought this was kind of funny. He represents both AT&T and, oh it wasn't him. Oh sorry, it's one of the other guys. One of the guys represents both AT&T and Deutsche Telekom, which I thought was kind of funny. Um, okay. And then we can see, um, his background, his career, he was at the National Republican Congressional Committee, he was at Bell South Corporation as a vice president where he did lobbying, worked for uh, Tom Corcoran, and so this kind of gives you his profile or who he is or what his background is, um, as well as, you know, what he's up to now. Um, one of the things that, you know, so when you start, you know, digging this and peeling this onion, it really is kind of peeling an onion and getting into who these guys are and what they're doing. So we know that there is this fundraiser. We know that there's this contact. We know that they're giving money around April uh, 14th. Um, um, actually, let me just show you. So then the next question is, you know, so, so what? For some individuals, let me just scroll down. These things are, here is... Uh, another guy who's gotten a lot of fundraising interest from AT&T, and this is uh, for Representative Joe Baca, and this is from 2008 from the Congressional Convention. I'm sorry this is so slow. I, took, I decided to take the chance on the Wi-Fi. There we go. So he has a golf tournament out, uh, and this was to get actually to get around a rule uh, that for when you're having a political convention, members of Congress can't fu fundraise there, so he had to be a certain distance away. So we had a fundraising tournament. Uh, AT&T was one of the hosts. There's a whole bunch of AT&T lobbyists. And if we look at, let me just show you this real quick. We did a story on this at the time, a uh, little blog entry, um, and pointing out you know, who all the hosts were. You've got Lyndon Boozer. Uh, you've got a bunch of other folks who are AT&T lobbyists who hosted this event for him where he raised money and also they had this golf game. And it notes that Boozer was one of 26 House Democrats who sent a letter to the FCC praising AT&T for its commitment to win approval for the AT&T Bell South merger. Um, these kinds of relationships continue over time. Uh, and we're actually doing a little story on this. This is from a, just a website. Uh, Baca put out a statement on the AT&T T-Mobile merger, and he very much supported it. So uh, you can kind of follow these things, you know, when you start digging into, you know, who's holding, hosting the fundraisers, what are the connections between the lobbyists and the members of Congress, uh, and then look for their actions and what they're, what they're doing. So, okay, so once you know this kind of stuff, what do you do with it? Um, one of the things... Uh, that Sunlight has funded, it's a grantee of ours called Little Sis. And this is a tool for, they call it, uh, and I love this term, uh, involuntary Facebook for the, for the rich and powerful. And it's a place where you can do public research on um, individuals, members of Congress, lobbyists, whatever, and it's already got, you can create a free account, and if anybody who's interested in Sunlight, you can create a group of researchers and tackle a particular topic. We have one going on now that's looking at the independent expenditure committees, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, but let me just stick in Dan Mattoon real quick. 
And so, let's see, there he is, Daniel Mattoon. And you can edit this profile. Yes, it, we, one of the things, one of the things we want to do is get better pictures for the site. And we have another project that we're uh, working on to get pictures of lobbyists and other folks. But anyway, um, it is a spoof, yes. Uh, if you look at um, the different um, categories, there's one for lobbying, services, transactions. These are all lobbying clients of his. You can edit each of these. And I'll just do one real quickly, bless you. Um, let's see, let's open that up. So you have the different relationships and so on, donations that he's made. And it's very, very simple to edit this. You can just add a relationship. And let's see, why don't we put in, because we know he's a lobbyist for AT&T. <coughs> Sorry, that keeps doing that. Um, and then you can see, let's see, let's pick AT&T down here. And they're a client of his. So we can say lobbying. And Daniel, whoops, AT&T hired Daniel Mattoon. And then you can put in where the information is coming from. It's coming from Open Secrets. And I think there's even Open Secrets, Mattoon and Associates. And so we can add that, and then we can add in other information. Like it, once you've added that, it's going to put in, give you the option to. Um, and then you can add in like when he lobbied from. Um, whoops, what was I going to select? Oh, I didn't. Hmm. I thought he did enter a source. There we go. Anyway, so you can so what you can do is like record this information, and when you start to build up these dossiers, you start to have real, um, you know, powerful things. This was used in during the healthcare debate. Uh, Bloomberg worked with um, Open Secrets and Little Sis to identify, and I forget what the number is off the top of my head, but all of the revolving door people who actually worked for uh, health interest in the healthcare debate and how many were flooding Capitol Hill. And you can, it was all recorded, uh, a lot of the research was recorded on this site. Uh, you can also look at financial reform lobbying or anything else, and it's a great thing to use for if you're interested in tracking what media companies are up to. And it's not just for lobbying. I mean, anything that these guys are up to, you can record it there. Hedge fund ownership of newspapers. You can start you know, at least making a dent in who these people are. Uh, it's a great tool for that. Um, let's see. I'm going to slightly shift gears real quick. Um, and show off. Let me see. Where is it? Oops. OK. One of the things that Sunlight also is interested in is, um, you know, obviously getting this information out and making it uh, easy and accessible for people to use it quickly and and find things out. And this is kind of a uh, and you know to understand that there's influence working all the time. This is a National Journal story that talks about. And I don't know why we keep picking on AT&T and T-Mobile and their merger, but it seemed to be in the news. Uh, they talked about how uh, the lobbying that was going on um, around this, um, the, the congressional committees were going to get involved in this issue. Um, Sunlight does a site called Polygraph. Whoops, that's the wrong one. Um, Sunlight does a site called Polygraph, the purpose of which is, and it's polygraph.com, and uh, um, the idea of this is, is that, oh, this will work well on this one, too. Uh, it basically uses... Uh, uh, entity extraction, looking for names and news articles, proper names, whatever, and it will go through and pull out, um, identify those things and point to how many campaign contributions they've gotten and so on and link them up. And so here's this National Journal article, and we've got, once again, Jay Rockefeller and others mentioned. Uh, the nice thing about Polygraph, it's a little bookmark that you can just drag it and pull it up into your, um, your toolbar. And let's go back to that National Journal one. I'm just going to click the polygraph. And what this will do is it'll run through the article and then pull up all these members of Congress, all the different companies mentioned. And as it searches, and then it, so it shows you who's getting money from whom, finds all the entities, 
and there's the report of influence. So it finds the points of influence first, then it cross-references them, and you can see that T-Mobile has aggregated $6,000 to Jay Rockefeller, Comcast to Jay Rockefeller, Comcast to Moore Smith, and so on, all the way through. And so when you see a news article that's talking about members of Congress and companies, you can use this to say, okay, well, is there a political influence, and can I track it? And this will at least give you some of the numbers, uh, because there usually is um, some money going one way or the other. Um, let me see. Uh, a couple other things I wanted to show real quick. Um, one of the things that Sunlight is doing, um, we've talked a lot about lobbying and how lobbying um, works and how um, uh, you can track it. Um, the reports that you see that have the money uh, disclosed, the amounts of money the, um, uh, that you know, the Center for Responsive Politics used are basically these quarterly reports that lobbyists file. Uh, you know, we ha don't have any yet for 2011. What we do have, though, whenever a new lobbyist is hired, within 45 days of being hired, they have to file a registration statement. And Sunlight has made a lobbyist registration tracker to kind of follow what these people are doing, what they're up to, and to try to give some sense of, you know, who's hiring whom when. And let me just kind of show you, you can search, it pulls off all the latest forms and you can browse through them. Thought, whoops, I think I typed that wrong. Let's try that again. Yes, it would probably help if I had an extra C. And so it'll pull up, these are the, uh, clients, uh, if you click on either one of these, and I'm sorry, there's not great name standardization, which is one of the problems that Sunlight is also working on, uh, you can see the different ones that they've hired. But the really fun thing is you can scroll down and look at the specific issues that they're um, interested in. And so and, and this was, you know, so we have a January 19th, 2011, they hired Peck Madigan at all. I'm sorry, Level 3 Communications did because they're interested in NBC Comcast merger, FCC deliberations on net neutrality and so on. Uh, all these different companies interested in that Comcast merger and lobbying on it. And what I like about this is you can kind of follow what's going on in real time. Uh, you know, again, these things are filed. They go up every single day of the week. Um, and you can kind of follow what's going on with lobbying. And, you know, it's um, in that way, like if you do AT&T, you can kind of also see that um, Actually, wait a minute. Let's do Spectrum real quick. If you're interested in Spectrum sales, you can also see like who's being hired to lobby on this particular issue. Did I spell that right? Yes. So, and I, and again, looking at the specific lobbying issues on these forms is really really critical to understanding um, what's going on. We kind of got the idea for this or started doing this because of the project that we did on um, unlimited money and the spending by outside groups. Um, whoops, that's the wrong link. Um, where is that? There we go, follow the unlimited money. Um, so anyway, Sunlight did this project um, where we tried to bring up the latest filings by all of these different organizations that are spending the unlimited amounts of money. And I think that the way that this works, there was a Citizens United ruling. Uh, you file with the Federal Election Commission as an uh, uh, it's called an independent, independent expenditure only committee, or also known as super PACs, uh, which I think is a slightly more um, interesting uh, terminology. And these organizations are able to raise money from any source and spend it um, on your direct advocacy, vote for, vote against this candidate. Um, there were uh, just, you know, um, Overall, outside groups spent like about 440 million. That wasn't all from super PACs. That includes the party committees and others. We have a breakdown on the on the website. But the, for the folks interested in the independent expenditure committees, we have a complete list on the site that shows you their registrations, who they are, um, and what they're up to. And you can click on each link to view the filings and actually see like who the treasurers are. And in fact, there we go. Treasurer named Jonathan, uh, Johnny J. Bardine, and you can look at the PDF, and that will have like information. Well, I'm not going to do that there, here. I don't have that plugin. 
Um, it'll have information, though, on who this uh, organization is and address and things like this. We've, uh, we've started looking at these because you know, one of the things that we've noticed that happens, like you know, when I began with the whole thing about the political action committees and hosting fundraisers for members of Congress, um, these guys have meetings. They're not disclosed with members of Congress all the time. Uh, somebody's actually working on getting better disclosure for when lobbyists actually meet with members of Congress. Um, the um, problem or the potential that we, you know, we haven't seen an example of this, but there are lobbyists now, I think we've identified about a half dozen, who are tied to independent expenditure committees. Now, if you think about what lobbyists do, a lot of them do run political action committees. They're in charge of giving out the money from a PAC, but that's limited to $5,000. So if you think about a member of Congress, he's got a lobbyist walking into his room, and he can size him up and say, well, this guy is worth about $70,000 to my campaign. If a lobbyist is tied to an independent expenditure only committee, the possibility is he walks into the room and you know that this is a guy who can drum, dump $10 million in your district uh, before you've uh, you know, had a chance to raise anything. It suddenly creates uh, a very different dynamic in Washington. Now, there's only like a half dozen that have done this, but again, if a lobbyist doesn't necessarily have to be the one who's registered to run the independent expenditure committee, if he's got access to it, uh, if there is, he's got ties to it, there's a real possibility of this happening. So we've been kind of tracking and trying to find out as much as we can about these organizations. Stop public unions now, Pat. You know, the thing about these, uh, the more explicit the name, the more likely it is it's not somebody who you have to worry about because they probably don't have a whole lot of money. I may be wrong about this one, <laughs> but... Um, uh, it's the ones you have to worry about are uh, a, a rosier future for America, because those, that can be anything. Um, although, I don't know, we could look up William O. Black and, and find out who he is and what he's up to. Um, but, you know, the other thing we found with these, you know, one of the things about independent expenditure when they file is that they are supposed to re uh, reveal some information on their donors. Um, Ryan Sibley, who's a wonderful reporter that works uh, with me at Sunlight Foundation, did a story where she tracked down, there was a, uh, an independent expenditure only committee, they disclosed their donors, and the donor to them was a 501c4 organization, the name of which escapes me, uh, although we can find the story if you'll give me a second. And you know the idea was is that basically, so I can give the 501c4 a million dollars, it can contribute $500,000 to, um, to the independent expenditure only, this is a super PAC, and my name is never published anywhere. So. Uh, there are all kinds of things, and you know, 2010 was largely a dress rehearsal for what's going to happen in 2012. Um, there are all kinds of different refinements and variations being built on these things, but the 501c4 being the donor to uh, the super PAC, I don't think anybody has come up with a way of, there, I don't think there's any legislation, it's not something really covered by the Disclose Act, so, and you know, and the if that doesn't work, they'll come up with some other trick. I mean, there's like a lot smarter people working for these guys who are usually a couple steps ahead. So what we try to do is make it public and make it uh, available to folks. But really, you really need people digging into this and trying to find out about it as much as they can, too, because uh, there just aren't enough reporters to cover all of it. So on that, why don't we break for questions? Um, and let's wait for the microphone. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yes. Is, is there someone else that... No, that, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, I was really upset at how little coverage in the mainstream media the um, stonewalling of the Disclose Act actually got so that, you know, groups like the Koch brothers can keep doing what they're doing under various names and there isn't a lot that can be done to know what they're actually contributing to. And with the Wisconsin situation, trying to defund public unions, when you gave your talk, what concerned me was there's a perception out there that, oh yeah, the unions are just as powerful as some of these like Koch brothers groups. And I'm sorry, but I don't think that's the case. Um, and I really wonder if anything more is going to be done to make some of these organizations disclose who they really are, or have they pretty much got Congress in their pocket at this point and we're not going to get a Disclose Act? I think I should, I 
think I should respond to that because I was talking about unions and corporations. I think unions are incredibly empower powerful through their boots on the ground. They represent people, reaching out to people. That's an incredibly powerful asset for unions that corporations simply do not have. I don't think it's um, as worrisome to well, uh, I might be completely wrong. It's not as worrisome to me to say, you know, people reaching out to people having conversations uh, as opposed to, you know, millions of dollars of in ads from unknown sources. But my sense is that unions are disclosing more through their, you know, everybody discloses their PAC donations, uh, contributions to PACs to the Federal Election Commission. Unions have 527s, political organizations, they're disclosed to the IRS. Corporations do too. Uh, 501Cs, contributions to 501C organizations are not disclosed to the IRS. And, uh, but unions have another level of disclosure at the Department of Labor, which I don't think has received enough scrutiny. I, it's like, it's just overwhelming detail about salaries and this expenditure, that expenditure. I've looked at the data, but we don't have the resources to dive into that data. Maybe we'll get funding from a conservative source to dive into the Department of Labor. But my sense is just, I think unions are very powerful uh, through assets that corporations do not have access to. And yes, there's an effort to wipe away those, that strength in, you know, the, take away the, the, the uh, uh, to undercut the, the power that unions have. Uh, the danger, uh, there is a great danger, I think, in the hidden money. Uh, and I believe, you know, we know, we can see at least hundred about $150 million in undisclosed donations to outside interest groups. We presume there is uh, hundreds of millions more because these groups have... Um, as tax-exempt organizations, they are not supposed to have a principal uh, 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 purpose of political activity, so they are spending probably 50% more money than what we're seeing, and so what is that being attributed, you know, what is that being expended on, where did it come from? We have no idea. It's just a giant black hole, and that's what I think is most concerning. We, we know where the union money is coming from. It's coming from members' dues. We can debate about whether or not that should be coming from members' dues, but the point is it's disclosed. There's other money, it's not disclosed. And that goes for you know, liberal groups, too. American Bridge is now, has now been blessed by the White House to uh, fight fire with fire. It's, you know, American Crossroads versus American Bridge. Uh, in 2012, and of course, where is that money coming from? It, it would be good to know, and I don't think, and their plan is to also have both the super PAC, which will disclose, and the 501C, just like American Crossroads, which will not disclose. And to me, that's incredibly concerning. Whether it's liberal or conservative, we need to have access. We have the right to know, as Americans, to know what these powerful interests are, be they left, right, or center, corporate or labor, about, that are trying to influence our democracy, our elections. And just to add really quickly, I mean, I think we're still at a point where we don't know what Congress is going to do. Uh, I don't know that there's any much of a opportunity for a Disclose Act in uh, in 2012. We'd like to see one, but or before the 2012 elections, but we probably won't see one. And there's even a question of whether or not the Federal Election Commission could implement an act like that uh, in the time allotted before the. I mean, 2012 is not very far away. Um, what generally happens, I mean, members of Congress, you know, if you think about McCain-Feingold, I mean, one of the big things that that act tried to regulate was outside spending, and politicians don't like uh, somebody coming in, and incumbent members of Congress, in a sense, have a vested interest in somehow limiting this flow of money, and again, and the reason is, is that the big advantage incumbents have is name recognition. If you look at what happened in 2010, a lot of these outside groups were the early funding to get name recognition for the challengers. And what they did was they built the challengers up and got them well known. And then the challengers were able to raise money on their own. So they provided this almost like, you know, think of it as a sort of a weird sort of um, uh, political venture funds. And once they had made that investment and these guys' names were known, then they could knock off the incumbent. Well, an incumbent doesn't want a system that works like that. So down the road, there may be some effort to do something about these. Um, but my sense is it's not going to happen anytime soon. Let me see. Why don't we do uh, the gentleman in the 
back with the glasses and curly hair. Sorry. Hi. Uh, I'm Rick Jell from Talkback TV. In, in the wonderful uh, websites that you've just displayed, what can we learn about an organization like American Crossroads, and more specifically, what can we learn about the media that they're creating, and for who? We both have yeah. sites. I mean, should we both just yeah. go there quickly? Um, so, so uh, both OpenSecrets.org and SunlightFoundation.com uh, have outside, sorry, outside spending uh, sections where you can look for a specific organization that is running advertising or other expenditures, independent expenditures, or electioneering communications. The difference being independent expenditures uh, directly target, uh, uh, expressly advocate the defeat or election of a candidate. Electioneering communications simply say, you know, call your congressman and ask them why they do these things. So, um, so they, they identify a, ca a federal candidate, but they don't expressly advocate their defeat or election. So you can look at how much money they have uh, reported uh, having spent to the Federal Election Commission on these ads. Uh, of course, again, super PACs like American Crossroads have to disclose where they got the money and where they, how they spent it. Um, 501Cs like, like Crossroads GPS need only disclose uh, expenditures, um, not the sources of cash. So you can, you can look up, uh, again, how much is being directed uh, by a particular organization at a particular campaign, or in some cases for independent expenditures, at a particular candidate. Um, and then you can look at the ads uh, on both our sites, you can look at the specific ads that they have sponsored. And of course, you can also find these ads on YouTube because er free media is, you know, why wouldn't you take advantage of that uh, if you're one of these organizations? Um, so, in, and uh, what is the uh, URL for um, the uh, ad campaign calling all sluice to oh, let... Uh Yes. Uh, we also did a site called Sunlight Cam. Uh, Sunlight Cam, was that a .org or a .com, Gab? <laughs> um, yeah, Sunlight Cam is a campaign ad monitor. And basically, the idea of this is, is that if you see an ad, you can report information on it. And actually, we want to, whoop. I hope it's up. Um, maybe it's not up right now. Let me try .org. Anyway, the idea of this is that if you see an ad, you can report it and put you know, information, what candidates is it mentioning, who is paying for it. Uh, you know, they usually say that, no, I guess it's not coming up. Um, uh, we will get that back up soon. But you know, the, the really important thing, I mean, Sheila mentioned you know, the things that the money that's being spent now and the 501c4s that don't, can only spend 50% of their money on political activities, actually less than half. When I was in Raleigh, North Carolina, um, all over TV, I was there for a conference, there's Mike Huckabee who's doing this thing called Repeal It Now. And it's just basically, he doesn't mention any member of Congress, he doesn't mention any p p uh, political candidate, but he talks and talks about reforming or repealing the Health Care Act. And it's paid for by a group, and if you, and you know, so I think it's like Reform It Now or whatever, Repeal It Now rather is the name of the group. Dot org, and if you look, the, if you Google the who is for the website, it's the same folks that run a Pittsburgh-based super PAC that spent money trying to elect Sharon Angle and a whole bunch of other people. So you know, I think that that's where this money is going. That you're going to see a lot more advertising. And then there's other things that they can do, uh, you know, training people and other things that you know, um, like the, tea, the American Freedom Works and some of the Tea Party groups do, and that you know happens on the left as well. So, uh, and that's the kind of thing that's really hard to trace. So. Let's see. I'm gonna. Uh, the gentleman right here. Well, well, I, I, uh, work for oh, could you wait for the microphone? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. I, I worked for uh, broadcasting in the uh, television, radio in uh, the Bay Area for uh, a number of years, about 40 years ago. And you had candidates uh, that were given uh, time on almost all the stations, commercial and uh, public stations, to make uh, uh, statements about. Uh, their candidate C and why they're running, and you had that. And, and then uh, uh, the FCC uh, chairman, uh, and I'm blanking on his name, uh, tr no, uh, the, the recent uh, fellow under Clinton. 
Powell, before Powell, the uh, Kennard. Kennard, under Clinton, <laughs> yeah, uh, had a proposal, a very modest proposal, to require broadcasters to give five minutes, uh, uh, a very modest amount for candidates. And that was his doom, in, in essence, in that issue camp issue and we haven't heard anything uh, about that you you've talked about uh, uh, you know there's a, a Godzilla here it's 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 come out and it's all money all the time I was in Colorado you just showed something about uh, buck mm -hmm. getting money from this American crossroads I mean this is uh, we're all going to be uh, uh, targets we're cannon fodder uh, ourselves we're the the targets for the, the can something be done is there any effort to to reinstate the, uh, a, a, a canard type of uh, proposal to reclaim the the airwaves the public airwaves for uh, the public purposes of a public election that's my question <laughs> I knew I was going to get these kinds of questions <laughs> uh, I can give you the the technocrat answer um, that that was the uh, the fairness doctrine, um, and I, I think the best memory of that is the old Johnny Carson routine when he had put on the flannel coat and he came on and he was from the country somewhere and he anyway it's probably a reference that's going over everybody's head anyway it used to be in the old days that when somebody came on and said something political you were that was the law was that you had to let somebody else come back on uh, come on the air at the same time with the same amount of time and and give the opposing viewpoint. <coughs> um, that got shot down, not, not so much because of the commissioner of the FCC, but because of the Reagan administration. They didn't like it very much. Um, the reason for it was uh, that, you know, these are the public airwaves, so therefore they should serve the public interest. And it seemed to make sense that it was in the public interest that if you were going to give one political viewpoint, uh, given that these are apolitical airwaves, that you should allow room for the opposing political viewpoint. Um, there's two problems with reviving that. Number one, it will never pass and it's actually one of the favorite right now and as far as the far right is concerned and the the Glenn Beck crowd um, that they want to come back with the fairness doctrine and it's a big brother and you know, all of this it's all crap um, that there is this move afoot in Congress to actually reinstate the fairness doctrine there is no move in, afoot in Congress to do this or at the FCC um, when I was at AP everybody tried to get me to write that story and I just got I almost put it on my answering machine don't ask me to write a fairness doctrine story <coughs> um, the chances of it happening are, are less than zero um, uh, for for one reason is there's no political will for it um, the, the other reason is that uh, not most of the media that we watch these days doesn't come over the airwaves you know what are you going to do about cable networks? It's not going to cover Glenn Beck or any of these guys. Uh, it'll call, it, it, it might cover the radio or whatever, but um, you know it's it's um, it's time that the broadcasters could be using uh, to make money on ads. And that's the sort of real politic answer. And the National Association of Broadcasters isn't nearly what it used to be, but it's still strong enough to knock that back and will we'll continue to be. I, I guess what I'm saying is don't hold your breath. Uh, buy an ad. Then <laughs> you can say whatever you want. I was, uh, just as an aside, on one of a radio station in Washington, there's a, uh, there is now a, a Scientology radio show on one of the biggest radio stations in Washington, and it's, it's a sports talk show. And Scientology has like an hour a week. God bless America. Um, how about uh, the gentleman in the back? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ravi Kapoor. I'm with KXT Channel 1 in San Francisco. Uh, my question concerns more Comcast NBC and just the lack of overall coverage. I know the Washington Post did a pretty good job in covering some of the issues, but nationally, we didn't see much at all, and I know this being in a Comcast market myself. Uh, we've been covering this, actually we're doing a documentary on the process, and uh, I spoke at an FCC panel on media ownership at Stanford last summer, and 75 people showed up. They had no press coverage about, the, I mean, we're in the, keep, keep in mind, it's at Stanford in the San Francisco Bay Area, and nobody showed up about media ownership. And this is in light of the in light of this merger. And so my, my concern is, 
where is the outcry to have our broadcasters, uh, you know, when we have these FCC panels going on uh, nationally, there, there's no uh, press mentions. We, we don't see any of the information uh, allocated to the public in the, in the matter it needs to be. And also, moreover, as, as things have progressed and the FCC rubber stamped the deal, now you see Michael Powell assuming the position from a former FCC commissioner to now the head of the NCTA, and the guy who was running the NCTA, Colin McSlero, is now working at Comcast. So I just want to know who's covering this, why isn't this being covered more? I'm a journalist by trade, I happen to get into ownership by chance, and we've created the most diverse TV station of its kind in America, and that's just because of the mindset that we have and all these diverse communities have been ignored, and fortunately we have 12 video signals on one TV station. But the question is, independence in media has disappeared, and by rubber stamping all these mergers, I mean, why aren't we, why is there more outcry? And obviously Sunlight does a very good job in exposing a lot of these facts, but what do you suggest needs to, uh, more, more that needs to be done? Well, there's about 10 issues in there. I'll see if I can knock off a couple of them, um, at least my view on them. Um, the, the, the NBC Comcast thing, it's, it's like, it's a dog that didn't bark. I mean, it, you're supposed to, I mean, I noticed there's a panel, uh, or there's a book, somebody wrote a book about what an abysmal job the financial press did of uh, predicting the collapse. And you know, they can, you could, somebody wrote a book about the Resolution Trust Corporation and the savings and loans too. It's very hard to sort of identify when the press does a crappy job. Um, now there was a, <laughs> there was a, a wonderful uh, example of, uh, of that not being true, which, uh, 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 New York Times wrote a brilliant article about the fact that General Electric and Jeff Immelt, who's now Obama's right-hand dude, um, uh, didn't pay any corporate income tax. And every major network, I think even Fox, covered this thing. NBC didn't think that it was news. Um, you know, that, that they got caught on that one. You know, cause somebody, but that was because somebody was paying attention. You know, I don't know how to make people care. I, I really don't. Um, because it, it's, uh, I think that that story sort of caught on a little bit. I think that, you know, if you look around you, I mean, I'm really, I'm really pleased with the turnout of the people in this room. I think people really do care. Um, but, you know, it's, the question is how do you make people care? And, and I think what, uh, what you're sort of waiting around to see, uh, or what I'm waiting around to see is eventually you know, you're going to hit, s there, somebody's going to make a really big mistake. Somebody's really going to screw up. Especially, there's going to be an email out there that says, we can't put that on the air because it's going to make the CEO look bad. I mean, I'm surprised there's not more of that stuff with all of the electronic media that's going on in email. Uh, but I don't know, maybe that'll, that won't even do it. I mean, I, 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 it's, it's an issue of engagement. Um, you know, we've, 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 we've caught lots of people red-handed over the years doing things that they shouldn't do. And, and watched these sort of stories fall flat. When I was at AP, I wrote these stories all the time. Nobody gave a damn. I mean, I never got any response on anything I wrote. I don't know if any of the newspaper editors even picked up the wire stories. It's kind of bleak, you know. I'm, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's not a real, uh, I, all I can to tell you is, you know, you're on the side of the angels and keep up the good work. And I just want to add to that, if you know of anybody like, uh, uh, the revolving door resource is to allow not just reporters but citizens to track who the people are that are spinning through government and into private industry and back into government, the reverse revolvers, like a, a Bill Daly who had worked, been president of SBC, and then, um, uh, you know, and then had um, worked for AT&T, uh, which merged with AT&T and then had worked for JP Morgan, which is financing the merger with T-Mobile. So uh, these are important uh, relationships for us all to know about. And if we are missing anybody that's important, please let us know. But also we hope that when you're going to town hall hearings and you know uh, agency hearings, you're keeping this information in mind and asking questions uh, with these relationships and, and, um, and monetary relationships in mind as well. In front here? Oh, the f wait for the microphone, sorry. Yeah, and talking about when things uh, kind of bleak out there, I think a lot of too is like, there's like no information sometimes, like not to beat it with a dead horse about fair doctrine, but um, like the public airwaves, 
they, I think a lot of people sometimes don't realize they are publicly owned. NBC, CBS, whatever, they don't own the airwaves. They lease the airwaves. But I'm not sure the public even knows that they own the airwaves. So if the public chose to say, well, we need to have uh, X amount of time, like public services for our elections, to take the money out, I mean, that's their right because they own the airwaves. I know politically it's very, very difficult ever to do. And then with the, I mean, maybe I'm kind of in orbit here, but with the, now everything going on internet, it's like the cables that are owned by Verizon, well, whoever, but still, those cables are on public land. I mean, we still have a dog in the fight in some ways, and I think it's just education is sometimes is, it's hard to do, but that's part of it. Hi, my name is Sita. I'm a fellow at the Yale Information Society Project. And um, if I understand things correctly, um, part of what you do is to challenge and fight corporate power and corporate influence on politics. And I'm just wondering um, if you're doing that, to what extent does your work need to address the sort of international um, aspect of corporate lobbying? or corporate influence on politics. So, for example, Brussels is now the lobbying capital of the world. Um, furthermore, companies like Google, Microsoft, some of the newer technology companies play different policy jurisdictions off of one another. So I'm wondering how you, if you plan to address this and how, um, and um, what, where, advocates specifically can intersect this debate because I think the international di dimension of, of what, you're, what you're doing and what you're highlighting is, is important. That's a, a very, very good question. Um, I know there's a group in Europe, and actually Sheila, did you talk to the conference? Uh, that are trying to get some better lobbying disclosure for what goes on in Brussels. Right now there really isn't any lobbying disclosure um, in a lot of countries. I know that in the UK they talked about, um, it was, I think it was in the UK, they talked about a lobbying bill, and the law firms went nuts and said, well, this will interfere with the ability of a lawyer to represent a client, and this is something that should never happen. You're trying to basically make these people go without representation, and it was just to disclose who was contacting the government on behalf of different interests. So uh, they've got a long way to go in Europe, and it's, um, you know, I would love to find a way to track it. You know, I know from the US, when, um, the IRS definition of what lobbying is, and because companies cannot deduct their expenses for lobbying, it all three, I mean, it's state, federal, local lobbying, there's nothing about international lobbying as being a deductible expense, so I, mean, I think there's a problem there. Um, you know, one way to address it would be for the U.S. to require maybe an SEC filings or maybe elsewhere to break out what they're spending on foreign lobbyists and where. Uh, but right now, I mean, it's, it's, I really think that we are kind of flying blind internationally. And it is, like, obviously hugely important to understand how these companies are influencing things overseas. And actually, Chuck wanted to do something on this topic, I think, a while back. I don't know if he's um, Charles Lewis, uh, who founded the Center for Public Integrity and the Investigative Reporting Workshop. You, I hate to... Chuck has like 50 good ideas every day, so I'm putting John on the spot. Do you remember, do you remember like number 17 on? <laughs> he created this thing called the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, of which Bill has edited probably 50 million words of, of English as a second language copy for and should have gotten a special medal for that. Um, but we had a really great network of journalists all over the world. Uh, and we had an idea where we were going to do a media project uh, to to bring them in, um, but it's just it's just damn hard. There's a lot of countries out there, um, and each one has its own sort of regulatory scheme. And uh, you know, just and there's there are global organizations that do some of that work. The closest I ever got to actually wanting to 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 actually taking a close look is to look at uh, basically you know U.S. hegemony. Uh, Overseas, you know, uh, U.S. is king bully on the block, and we are uh, flogging our intellectual uh, property rights over everyone's head everywhere we go. Um, so, what what the U.S. is doing to protect its own 
uh, corporations is kind of sets the agenda anyway in a lot of areas. So there's an awful lot that you can do globally actually right out of Washington. Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of that that's going on. Um, and it would be great if we could see it kind of come from the other direction. And we, we tried that with that consortium, and I don't know what ICIJ has been doing lately, but you know, that's still in the works, and who knows, we may still resurrect that idea. I just want to add to that. There are three organizations that are tracking lobbying in Europe, uh, Alter EU uh, in Brussels, Spinwatch in London, and uh, uh, Lobby Control in Berlin. All of them, so they hosted me to come over and speak in their cities about the U.S. system and to, and we don't, at the Center for Responsive Politics, we don't advocate campaign finance reform or a specific platform for reform other than disclosure. We uh, are very adamant that we can't do our job and the press, a free press, can't do their job if they don't have access to the information. And we were there to say, this is not uh, a burden for the industry. You can do this. And the industry there is saying, no, 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 it has to be voluntary. It's working fine. You know, don't look at the people and the millions of dollars behind the curtain. Uh, so they are struggling with that battle there. Um, if you're interested, you can, I would suggest uh, checking out Alter EU, uh, which is a group of, uh, uh, I think, progressive organizations. I don't know if there's any that are kind of nonpartisan, but. Uh, organizations that are interested in this, and they host a listserv called Lobbyocracy that tracks uh, lobbying efforts and the import of our lobbying industry to their shores. Okay, I guess I think we have time for one more. So um, let's see. Um, uh, how about the gentleman right in front? Okay. What are the legal obligations of a private citizen taking information off of the internet, publishing it on their personal website or a Facebook page? When could you get in trouble or in, is there any violation of uh, someone's rights? Uh, like taking information from, you know, secrets data, you know, open secrets data. Yeah. We, we encourage people to take the information from our website and put it on their Facebook page. So on our site all over it says, Feel free to use this information, just credit the center. Can I add, there's a session on that tomorrow, on that topic. Oh, there you go. A whole session. Okay, well thank you everybody so much. And, uh,